Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2015. My name is Jason Patlas. I'm the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, uh, serving as host for Capitol Hill Ocean Week. We're delighted to serve as host yet again, now in our 13th year. I'm particularly excited by the breadth of topics that we will cover over the next few days. It's been three years that we've been in the museum, and by virtue of that, we've been able to take advantage of this wonderful venue, the state-of-the-art facilities, to broadcast globally, thanks to our partner, NOAA Oceans Live. And over the next few days, we will literally be roaming the globe, starting with our opening keynote speaker, uh, representing the French government, serving as minister. Uh, we will have presentations for Cuba, for the Arctic, for the Asia Pacific, for the Caribbean, and then coastal communities here across the country. Thanks to NOAA's Oceans Live, we will be representing the topics with the breadth of the audience that we've seen. Last year, we had 46 countries tuning in across six continents, 7,000 viewers. That is quite a number that only a few years ago was unimaginable. And so we have looked to grow Chow to reflect and mirror the audience that we have across the globe. We begin Chow this week with some auspicious milestones. Last week, the president declared June to be National Oceans Month. Yesterday was World Oceans Day. This is Capitol Hill Ocean Week. But I think for all of us in the room, we know that every day is Oceans Day, and Earth Day should be Oceans Day, and planet Earth should really be planet ocean. And if there's any uncertainty in that premise, stick around for three days, and by Thursday afternoon, I guarantee you will have no doubt about that fact. <laughs> now, there's big news today for our National Marine Sanctuaries. Today, in fact, is the day that the new boundaries of the Cordell Bank and the Gulf of the Fairlands National Marine Sanctuaries take effect. Those new boundaries extend those two sanctuaries more than double their current size. It represents more than a decade worth of effort on the part of members of Congress, past and present, the administration, groups in California, and stakeholders across the country. It has been a long effort to get to today, and today, auspiciously, is when those boundaries take effect. A round of applause for our National Marine Sanctuaries. There are some exciting developments for Capitol Hill Ocean Week uh, that you will see and hear over the next few days. Uh, you can follow all things Chow related and personalize your Chow experience, if you don't already, through the new Chow mobile app that you can get thanks to uh, your Apple Store or your Google Play Store. Uh, download it. You'll need your conference registration ID for it, but it's really a terrific job that the staff has done to put together that web application, that uh, mobile app for you. We also have uh, multiple pin sites across the country. In fact, early news yesterday came not from here in Washington, D.C., but from Alpena, Michigan, that was advertising the fact that Chow will be broadcast in the uh, Education Center of the Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena. And so Chow continues to grow beyond the four walls that we have here today and go globally. Lastly, there's some big news for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. As we continue to grow and evolve as a stronger partner for our National Marine Sanctuaries, we are undertaking a new look and feel that is more commensurate with this new role. As you can see, uh, our current logo is looking a little stale and dated, and so we felt we needed something that was a little more modern, a little more 21st century, and that stood out a little more among the crowd. And so we have a new logo to unveil. We've been working six months with a marketing firm in New York to design a new brand campaign for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And the first order of business has been these new logo designs. But represented by this logo is not only something that's a little new and splashy, but something that really reflects our partnership with the National Marine Sanctuary System. And you could see the two logos side by side here. 
something that emphasizes the fact that we are the only organization that is 100% exclusively dedicated to our national marine sanctuaries. We also needed something that brings our most important, our most visible event of the year, Capitol Hill Ocean Week, into our brand. And so you will see around the room, around the conference, a new logo for Capitol Hill Ocean Week. These are all very exciting developments, and there will be more to come. This is just first out of the gate. We will have a new website over the summer. We'll have a new campaign launched in the fall uh, for the anniversary of the National Marine Sanctuary System. And as part of that, I want to give you a teaser of what to expect, something that will make you think differently about life, something that will give you an opportunity to escape our everyday lives, that will allow us to transcend the superficiality of modern day society, something that will make us think differently, be better, and go deeper. Now, many of you may recognize that handiwork as the handiwork of our chairman, Bob Talbot. Uh, and I'd like to thank Bob, who donated his time to produce that, along with Dave Crighty, who did the graphics of Glyphic Corporation. And again, that will be a teaser for what to expect over the next several months. I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, some of whom are here today, will be coming in and who will be coming in all week long for making uh, this week possible. I'd like to thank all of you and our audience here and online. And I would especially like to thank all of our sponsors who have made this event possible. You'll see the names of our sponsors in the program, on the slides, on the app. And one thing to note is the breadth and number of those sponsors, which continues to grow each year. And it's thanks to them that we're able to deliver a world-class event that continues to improve annually. A round of applause, please, for our sponsors. Now it's my great honor to introduce this year's opening keynote speaker, uh, Minister Ségolène Royal, France's Minister of Ecology, Sustainable Development and Energy. Minister Royal has held this position since April 2014 and is leading efforts to strengthen marine conservation not only within the EEZ of France, which happens to be second only to the US in terms of size globally, but she's leading this effort worldwide. And in particular, Minister Royale is playing a leading role as France prepares to host the 21st Conference of the Parties for the Climate Change Convention later in the year in Paris. Minister Royale has been a driving political force in France for the last three decades. And it really is a great honor that she is here visiting with us today and is serving as our opening keynote. Minister, Madam Minister. Dear Jason Patrice, dear John Aldrin, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome the many guests gathered here this morning to discuss the sea and the oceans, a very important cause. Over the past 15 years, show has become a very popular event every year. This year, you will examine the priority issues relating to maritime policies ocean management and conservation, and the economic contribution on, of the ocean. 
In fact, the planet only really has one ocean which con connects the continents to one another. It serves as a link. And the frigate Hermione, the spectacular frigate that we greeted as it arrived in Yorktown in the United States, and which we will again celebrate this evening in Mount Vernon, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, the ocean that united us, unites us. I would like to talk about two phenomena that affect the ocean, climate change and the pressures of, on marine biodiversity. Yesterday, June the 18th, was the international, the 8th, was the International Day of Ocean. At UNESCO in Paris, the Ocean Climate Platform, comprised of the NGOs and scientists, made a call to take oceans more into account in the climate negotiations in the run-up to COP21 in Paris, stressing the importance of oceans to tackle the problem of climate change. Indeed, climate change has a direct impact on the oceans, and notably on ocean acidification. Oceans cover 21 of the Earth's surface, you know that. Life started there. The oceans and the atmosphere are closely linked. They exchange energy in the form of heat and, heat and humidity. The oceans, therefore, play a huge role in regulating climate. But average air temperatures on the planet's surface and on the surface of the ocean are rising. You know that. And average sea levels have been rising faster than ever since the end of the last ice age. The oceans capture almost 26% of carbon emissions. But they are becoming more acidic due to, to the excessive production of carbonic acid. This has a negative impact on certain varieties of plankton and poses a threat to the entire marine food chain, as well as to the socio-economic activities that are dependent on the oceans. Rapid changes in the chemical composition of seawater have a detrimental effect on ocean ecosystems. All these affects marine biodiversity, which, despite all its richness and despite the expense of the oceans, is fragile. Recent studies carried out by France's National Center for Scientific Research showed that almost all the world's oceans will undergo profound changes in their biodiversity if global warming is not controlled. There will be a proliferation of foreign species, jellyfish, sargassum, and other species will disappear, especially those that can currently be fished. Out of 3,000 marine species study, studied by U, uh, EUCN, 22% were classified as threatened, i.e. vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. The world has already lost 20% of its coral reefs. 60% of the world's large marine ecosystems have been damaged. Uh, 32 uh, of global fish stocks are overexploited, depleted, or are recovering. This figure stood at 25% in uh, two, 2006. The depletion of resources leads to the development of new damages, deep water fishing and mining, sea transport in the polar regions, drifting wastes, waste in all of the world's seas, new activities that lead in turn to other consequences. So what should we do? 
the international community must assume its responsibilities in order to protect the oceans. The G7 summit yesterday in Germany made strides in recognizing the need to protect our oceans from the scourge of marine litter, litter in particular plastic litter. This poses a global challenge directly affecting, affect, affecting marine and coastal life and ecosystems and potentially also human health. France and the United States bear a special responsibility. France possesses the second largest maritime surface area in the world, with an exclusive economic zone of 11 million kilometers carré, 20 times the surface area of mainland France. Same on that in the United States with 11.3 kilometers carré. This means that we bear a major responsibility. Our country's exclusive economic zone harbors 10% of the world's coral reefs, 20% of its atoll, and 6% of its submarine mountains. These are environments of great biological diversity. They support many economic activities. So we are working to establish a global network of marine protected areas. We are beginning at home. I, I put on the table an ambitious goal uh, to make 20% of, of the waters within French territorial limits marine protected areas by 2020. And we are already at 16%. In continental France, I am finalizing a network of 10 marine natural parks. In June 2014, I established a natural marine park of the Arcachon Bassin. In April 2015, the natural marine park of the Gironde Estuary and the Mer des Pertus. Studies are currently underway for the three other marine natural parks in France, in Martinique, Corsica, and the Norman Breton Gulf. In the Pacific, the Coral Sea Natural Park was established last year in New Caledonia. At 1.3 million square kilometers, almost the entire exclusive economic zone of the New Caledonia, the park is now one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. With the bill to restore biodiversity, nature, and landscape that I am bringing before Parliament, I gave France its first plan to protect 55,000 hectares of mangrove forest and 75% of its coral reefs. I signed this commitment in Guadeloupe a few months ago. The bill also provides for creating a new tool, the fisheries reserve. But we must also act on the international level. I'll support the goal of raising the world's marine protected areas to 10% by 2020, compared with 3% today only. We are acting through five international agreements and programs to protect regional seas. I actively support the Cartagena Convention in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean the marine mammal sanctuary in the Caribbean, which covers more than 143,000 square kilometers, will foster ties between the Caribbean nations and members of the convention. In Guadeloupe, I recently set up a steering committee whose project is the reintroduction of manatees to the area. The activity center for spore wreck protected areas housed by France, will study the proliferation of kelp on Caribbean beaches, which threaten the tourism industry. Concerning Antarctica, this year I will submit on behalf of France and together with Australia and the European Union, a proposal for marine protected area, areas in, East, in, in Eastern Antarctica 
to the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. I know that the United States and New Zealand are also working very actively on a project to establish a marine protected area in the Ross Sea, a project I support. I strongly hope that these two projects, which, which mutually support one another, will be approved this year. And I have not forgotten that France and the United States are founding members of the International Coral Reef Initiative, which now counts more than 60 members. Turning now to the high seas beyond national territorial limits. The high seas are emblematic of a particular multilateral challenge as they have no owner and represent a source of enormous barely explored wealth. They account for 64% of the Earth's seas and oceans. The G7 yesterday addressed the issue of deep sea mining beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. The leaders called on the International Seabed Authority, Authority to continue its work on a clear, effective, and transparent code for sustainable deep sea mining. The exceptionally rich marine biodiversity of these waters deserves a protection that is equal to the challenges within the framework of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Montego Bay Convention, which is a veritable constitution for the ocean. The international community is working to develop a global instrument under the auspices of the Montego Bay Convention. This instrument should be a crucial step toward a better shared management of these vulnerable common spaces. And I am convinced that the governance of the high seas deserves an universal instrument within the United Nations as part of the Rio Plus 20 commitments. The challenges are enormous, but so are our energy and determination. Ladies and gentlemen, these environmental challenges will appear in all the issues you discuss, maritime and marine policies, tourism, energy, food security, technologies, the ocean's contribution to the economy. The marine sector may stand in the forefront front of change, turning what was long perce perceived as a constraint, the preservation of environment into an asset. I would like to conclude by sharing a thought about our own bodies. I got the information from Gilles Boeuf, the president of the Natural History Museum in Paris, which is a great scientist. He, say, he says, why is the concentration of sodium and potassium chloride in our blood, our cerebrospinal fluid, and our tears, 280 to 302, million moles per kilo. That's not the osmolarity of seawater or river water. It's a salt concentration of estuary water. Our blood is simply the story of life, the mixture of fresh water and salt water at the point where rivers <laughs> empty into the ocean. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank Madam Minister for those wonderful remarks. I would also like to thank 
Madam Minister, for the wonderful cooperation that exists between France and the United States. Uh, specifically, the French Marine Protected Area Agency, under the jurisdiction of Madam Minister, works very closely with our National Marine Sanctuary System and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And they have wonderful partnerships on both sides of, uh, of the globe with a sister sanctuary relationship between Stowag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary and French Antilles. And through the Big Ocean Initiative, bringing all of the large-scale MPA managers together in the Pacific and globally to share information, to learn from each other. And it's really France and the U.S. that are leading that Big Ocean Initiative. So thank you, Minister, not just for today, but for everything that you and your team are doing. Uh, as a token of that gratitude, I'd like to present you with a gift. Uh, this is a book, America's Underwater Treasures. Some of you may know it. It happens to have been done by a compatriot of yours, Madam Minister, you, uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau, uh, the son of Jacques Cousteau. And Jean-Michel is uh, an avid fan of sanctuaries as he is of his own country. Um, and he did this for us a number of years. Uh, it's limited edition. Uh, in fact, I only have three copies left. <laughs> and, and after this, I have two. Uh, but I'm really honored and delighted to present it to you as a token of our appreciation, as an encouragement to come back to the U.S. and this time get under the water and dive in one of our national marine sanctuaries. Nice so thank you. I will give a, make you a gift ah. too. It's the, the Hermione. Ah. Aussi. <laughs> voilà, c'est le lien aussi sur les océans. Voilà. Thank you. Uh, this is lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. A 15-minute break. We'll be back at 11:15. Thank you very much.